Well, welcome to the next session here of our uh, Global Trends Conference. I'm Bannon Garrett. I'm director of the Strategic Foresight Initiative at the Atlantic Council. And I've had the great privilege uh, and honor to work with Matt Burroughs over the last six, seven years on the Global Trends Reports, traveling around the world. That's been a, a really terrific and educational and I would even say at times fun experience uh, doing that. So I'm really glad you're all here and we have this panel now. And as we were talking about it uh, before the panel started, uh, it's titled of individual versus the state, but maybe we want to broaden that out to the individual in cooperation with the state as well. So it's, uh, we don't want to totally polarize, but I do think it's somewhat uh, useful to look back on the sort of tension between the state and the individual as, uh, shall we say, underlay the uh, relationship between uh, citizens and states uh, for, uh, I guess, of all of history or back to the tribe and uh, earlier eras. And then in the 20th century, we end up with this very uh, polarized situation with uh, communism and fascism on one side with a sort of totalitarian view of uh, an effort to control the citizen. And then democracy trying to uh, put on the other side of the, of the struggle. We know, how it, we know how that one came out. Uh, but it's interesting that the whole notion of democracy was having rights to be protected by the state, protection from the state, the right to choose and, and change leaders. Uh, in the United States, this was, I think, the most extreme form in the sense that there's at least the founding myth that we actually created the state. We gave the state powers and we can take them away as the, as the people, which I think is quite different than Europe, where people wrested power from the state. And, and from the monarchies and tried to get more and more protection for the individual and more and more rights. But even in the U.S., we still now have the voices raising fears of the socialist state that's going to take away their freedom. So this struggle sort of goes on and on, uh, but it has and will continue. But I think that one of the reasons that this panel is interesting is because we're really asking, that in part, is, is the situation changed? And Matt, yesterday, in laying out the Global Trends Report, uh, in talking about individual empowerment noted that you know we're in a new era of, of a huge expansion of the middle class of perhaps from 1 billion to 3 billion by 2030 uh, and, and that's driven in part by education much better health uh, much uh, you know hugely increased economies which are both driven by and, and result in the rise of the middle class and of course we talk a lot about the uh, new technologies uh, on, uh, social media, smartphones, all that, and I would add even in 3D printing's empowering the individual as well to become almost a, you're an individual designer and manufacturer, something that was completely impossible in the past. So this is a, a very different era that we're entering into, I think, and I think that's why this panel is, is very interesting uh, in, in, because with so many different things are going on. We, of course, have uh, been looking at the Arab Spring and Occupy Wall Street, uh, that all the new means of communications, all that, that uh, change that we've seen. Uh, and, and, and very, un as uh, William Gibson uh, once said, the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed, that we see things at various stages in various parts of the world. So I think, first I just want to introduce our extraordinary panel today. We have an amazing uh, group of people. Jared Cohen, uh, on my far left there, is the director of Google Ideas that is described as a new entity at Google aiming to reframe and act on old challenges as news in new and innovative ways. Jared is also an adjunct senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations where he focuses on terrorism and counter radicalization, the impact of, of connection technologies and 21st century statecraft. Previously, Jared served on the State Department's policy planning staff. He's also author of Children of Jihad, 100 Days of Silence, and coming out, April 23rd, put your orders in, the new digital age. As far as I know, he has not written a book on Berlin in 1961. <laughs> I heard it was great. <laughs> uh, Marnie Levine is Vice President for Global Public Policy at Facebook and oversees the company's efforts to work with governments and NGOs and train them and inform them about this new technology. Marnie is no stranger to Washington like uh, Jared. She uh, uh, she joined Facebook, I think, uh, two, what, two and a half years ago? And before that was in the Obama administration. She worked as chief of staff for uh, National uh, Economic Council under Larry Summers, and prior to that, she was working with Larry at, uh, at Harvard. And uh, where she earlier received an MBA and 
Jared and I from uh, Stanford will forgive her for that, but it's, uh, you know, the Stanford of the East, as we always uh, called it out there. <laughs> uh, and then Hisham Qasim uh, is an independent reporter and founder of Al-Masri Al-Yum, or Egypt Today, Egypt's only independent newspaper. He's one of Egypt's most prominent publishers and democracy activist and former vice president of the liberal opposition Tomorrow Party. He is also a member of the advisory board of the Atlantic Council's Rafiq Hariri Center for the Middle East. And he served as chairman of the Egyptian Organization for Human Rights and has done many extraordinary and brave things in Egypt that uh, hopefully will be discussed as well. So with that, I'd uh, like to just p frame a couple questions that I think we'd like to look into. I mean, and remember, we're trying to envision out to 2030, not just look at what is going on today. And so we're sort of the question of the balance between the state and individual, is it going to shift toward the individual, uh, even in currently authoritarian states, or we're going to see new technologies but allow the state to have more control, which may be or may not be the case? Uh, will there be sort of a new, re really new relationship between the state and individuals, with the individuals playing a bigger role in managing public life through new technologies, through mobilization, in fact, even maybe a blurring between the state and the individual in many cases uh, as the individuals in the society take more, build, play more of a role in doing things the state in the past did. And on the international level, will the state's prerogatives be significantly curtailed by the empowerment of individuals and non-state actors? Uh, will they play a, a bigger role in solving global problems, which was suggested in the Global Trends Report in the non-state actors world? Uh, and more, more of a kind of, again, blurring of responsibilities. Where does the state end and the individual begin? Maybe uh, a different, very different relationship going forward. And then we, of course, have, uh, we'll want to talk about the uh, threats posed to security by small groups and individuals with access to high, highly lethal technologies and uh, um, from bioware uh, weapons to uh, cyber drones, precision strike capable, all kinds of wonderful goodies being created in our new technology world that, uh, that allow the individuals to do all kinds of really nasty things as well as some very good things. And I think just last piece of interest to me is like, will there be new, as we look down the road at new technologies that may develop, and I don't mean we need a technology discussion per se, will this actually change things even more in terms of this whole question of the relationship of the individual to the state, the empowered individual, empowered group. So with that, I'll go to Jared maybe to start. Okay. Uh, make five minutes of uh, sort of opening comments to get us started. Sounds good, Benny. Uh, thank you very much, and, and thank you to the Atlanta Council. Uh, it's really an honor and a, and a privilege to be here. Um, let me uh, start with some, some general observations, um, which is currently today you have two billion people connected to the internet. Um, to me, the biggest change by 2030 is that in the next you know, decade, five billion new people are going to connect to the internet. Uh, the next five billion people to connect to the internet are connecting in the parts of the world ridden with the greatest number of challenges, where conflict is the most prevalent, uh, where violence exists uh, in a far more pervasive way than it does with the first two billion. So the way to think about this is it's not Islamabad coming online, it's Fatah and Baluchistan coming online. And what are the implications of that? But let me start with something more positive, which is with five billion new people connecting to the internet, we know that there are certain untold benefits for citizens of the future. Uh, perhaps one of the most striking changes is going to be the advent of uh, simultaneous uh, instant translation capability that picks up our mannerisms, our accents, and that allows a individual in Burma to have a conversation that's simultaneously translated with an individual in Venezuela. Uh, we'll be able to fully explore the cross-cultural and uh, geographic collaborations and interactions that have never been before possible in history. Uh, 3D printing will create an entirely new wave of secondary markets. Um, we're going to see virtual urbanization happen at a faster pace than physical urbanization of, as individuals in rural environments have access to the marketplace of ideas even without having to physically move. Um, innovations in health are going to allow individuals to swallow a pill uh, that, uh, you know, uh, if they're not feeling well, that is able to detect certain uh, symptoms simultaneously, uh, uh, send them to their smartphone and make a recommendation about what might be wrong with them, where the local doctor is, and what appointments are available. These are just some of the extraordinary things that are on, on the horizon. 
Um, now, there are certain things that technology won't do for citizens. Obviously, we, we know it will make them more efficient, the quality of life will improve, and there'll be more opportunities. But at the end of the day, the impoverished will still be impoverished, uh, the sick will still be sick, and those that are at risk of physical violence uh, will find that, you know, as useful as a smartphone is, it doesn't stop uh, war, it doesn't stop uh, sexual and gender-based violence, it doesn't stop a lot of the threats that we see in different environments. Uh, but the purpose of this session is to talk about 2030. Um, and so let me be a little bit more provocative. Um, and let me sort of uh, move towards uh, states because I think this is where uh, there, there's greater uncertainty. I think the story of citizens is a little bit easier to, to understand in, in, in the future. Uh, the challenge that states of the future will encounter is the number of virtual citizens that they have will far outnumber the number of physical citizens they have. And while I don't reject the notion that states will still be the dominant unit in the international system, I do believe that, as General Cartwright said yesterday, we're about to enter a very turbulent transition where the most democratic states to the most repressive states will find that they're going to go in one generation from the vast majority of their population not being connected to the vast majority of their population being connected. And it's going to happen very fast, and it's going to happen in very unpredictable ways. Um, I believe that cyberspace is the world's largest ungoverned space. Uh, now, again, there's many benefits to that, but there's many challenges to that for a state. So states are not going to cease to be the most powerful actor in the, uh, the international system, but they're going to find that some of their power begins to erode, and they're going to find uh, it's not a question of uh, will they have the power, it's a question of how much power will they have. Uh, now, the first challenge that states will experience as they go through this turbulent transition is they're going to try to replicate the laws of the physical world in cyberspace. Um, that's going to be basically impossible. It's not going to prevent them from trying, um, but they're going to find that it's hard enough to enforce laws in the physical world, let alone in uh, this giant ungoverned uh, transnational space. Um, so let me be even a little bit more provocative here, and I'm looking at, at, at Barry because he's giving me you know, signals to, to do so. Um, uh, uh, my, my view is the natural reaction for states that uh, uh, will, will occur as a result of them not being able to replicate the, the, these laws will be the balkanization of the internet. Um, and I don't mean separate intranets. What I mean is a different internet experience in different societies based on how they filter. And we're already seeing this today with the first two billion. And there's lots of different ways that states uh, filter out information to create a specialized internet experience. You know, the most obvious uh, and apparent category to us is the blatant. Uh, states like China, um, uh, states like Iran, uh, that you know, are sort of unabashed in, in, in terms of how they uh, censor the internet and how they, they, they filter. Then you have states like Turkey that sort of follow a more sheepish model, which is they try to couch it as parental controls, but under parental controls also comes curbing political dissent. Um, and then you have the third category, which is the politically acceptable. And Germany is a good example of this as they filter out neo-Nazi and, and, and hate speech. And so those are sort of the three models for filtering. But in the future, uh, this is going to happen all across the world. Now, what's the consequence of the balkanization of the internet? The first consequence is that states will band together to edit the web in collaboration. So you can imagine an autocratic cyber union forming uh, between countries like you know, Venezuela, you know, Russia, some of the Middle Eastern countries, some of the African countries, where they all agree to filter out certain uh, content. You can imagine a collection of states that are particularly fond of their uh, you know, founding uh, father agreeing to filter out negative things about each other's uh, founding father. So this is sort of uh, you know, the, 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 the new way of doing alliances in, in cyberspace is, is around collective editing. Uh, the second consequence, and I think this is the one with the real geopolitical implications, is that in the future, uh, every state will have two foreign policies and two domestic policies, one for the physical world and one for the virtual world. And at times, they'll actually be in contradiction with one another. So if you think about it, uh, today, uh, there's a number of states that physically function as allies, but in cyberspace, uh, engage in you know, truly adversarial behavior. Um, now, my view is the true testament of power in the future is not just what a state can do in the physical world, but what a state is able to do and get away with in cyberspace. Um, you know, ultimately, both citizens and states are going to increasingly split their time between the physical and the virtual world. And how they sort of do that dance and how they exert power in both um, is ultimately going to result in, 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 in what their overall, uh, their overall influence is. So you may have some states that are physically very weak, but have tremendous cybersecurity capability. Or you may have some states that are, are physical pariahs, but have one of the most effective cyber kinetic uh, 
uh, capabilities in the international system, in which case they'll punch above their weight in cyberspace, but they might you know, sort of not function very effectively um, in the physical world. And then I'd probably reach my, my five minutes, so I'll just sort of tease two other things which we'll get to later. To me, the two most disruptive uh, things to the state uh, in the present and the future will be terrorism and revolution, and I look forward to talking about how technology will transform both of those. Great. Marnie, please. Thank you, Jerry. So, um, first of all, thank you for having me here, too, and I want to congratulate you on the Global Trends 2030 uh, report, which was certainly very um, interesting and provocative and stimulating to be able to think about um, what's coming in the future. And I certainly found that um, it was heartening to see that the trend is towards individual empowerment, and that's been my experience working at Facebook. Jared sort of talked about, he talked about the theoretical and what's going to happen in 2030, but to really understand 2030, I actually think that we're at this critical moment right now, right here, this like inflection point, where we're seeing all of these things that Jared just described coming to a head. And so what will happen in 2030 really matters now. So let me just, let me just uh, talk about a couple things. Jared talked about some of these um, macro st statistics and what the projections are. With Facebook, um, which was started in 2004, uh, we now have a billion users using Facebook. It took eight years to have a billion people using Facebook. We have 600 million people using Facebook on mobile. And that means that people are connected through a device that they carry with them all the time. So never before have we ever been so connected to each other, to knowledge, and to information. And that has profound consequences for how we relate to each other, how we relate to governments, and the opportunities that exist. And the opportunities come in the form of economic opportunities, social opportunities, and political opportunity. When it comes to economic opportunity, we've analyzed, um, or there have been others who have analyzed the effect that a, pl a platform like Facebook has where you have all of these connections. It creates a lot of economic opportunity where there wasn't opportunity before. Um, University of Maryland did a study and analyzed that the Facebook platform, um, that the app economy, um, has resulted in roughly 230,000 jobs in the U.S. And, um, and about $15 billion in economic value in the U.S. The same kind of analysis was done by Deloitte in Europe and found that roughly 200, 230,000 jobs were created in, um, in European countries and about um, 15, billion dollars in, uh, 15 billion euro of economic value was created through, this, uh, through the Facebook platform as well. So, there, so the kinds of economic opportunities that exist through Facebook um, will only continue to grow as long as these connections, um, as long as these connections can happen. In terms, of, um, in terms of social opportunity, one of the more interesting elements of a more connected open world is the kind of effect that, um, the kind of influence that people can have on each other. And we've seen that in all kinds of different ways. We see that when um, that you can that if uh, that if if a friend tells you to check out a restaurant or to see a movie, you're more likely to do that because you have a trusted friend who tells you that. And the same can be said about social issues. So if you find that your friend is conserving energy, you are going to be much more inclined to figure out ways to um, also try to conserve energy. And so you can have a kind of um, global consciousness that develops out of this. And um, so when it comes to civic engagement and civic uh, activity, um, you're 57% more likely to go to a rally or to, or to vote <coughs> if a friend tells you about this. And you saw that when, there, when the tsunami earthquake happened in Japan, it can also be through these connections that people come together in common cause to raise money to get important information to each other and, um, and to, uh, again, inform each other about uh, ways to get involved around, uh, around causes. So a, so a kind of global consciousness has evolved through these connections around the world when you have um, a, one of the biggest borderless global communities that has emerged and is no longer constrained by borders of a, of a country. Um, and finally, when we talk about this sort of individual versus state, there are, the individual certainly has had opportunity through platforms like 
uh, Facebook or, or Twitter or, or, e or Google and just being connected through the internet. You have, uh, it used to be that um, individuals didn't have any kind of a voice and that platforms like Facebook have given individuals voice where they haven't had it before. In 2008, Oscar Morales was an engineer who decided that he was tired of some of the ways that the FARC was behaving, kidnapping, lying. And so one man, one guy, who wasn't necessarily part of an important family, who wasn't, didn't necessarily have incredible means at his disposal, but was able to sit in a room and organize and mobilize people around a common cause. And that happened by shifting power from institutions to individuals. So individuals certainly have had there has been a shift to empower individuals. But the same can be said about governments. And what we are finding is that it's no longer about, it's no longer just a question of whether governments will use social media to connect to individual, but they're using social media to be able to have a two-way dialogue with individuals. It's not individuals versus the state necessarily, it's individuals with the state and collaborating and conversing and talking. In the UAE, Sheikh Mohammed um, was trying to figure out what, what they should do to celebrate Ramadan. And he crowdsourced a set of ideas from, um, from citizens. And citizens said, let's create an orphanage. And so he, gets, so he got an idea to create an orphanage, and that's what, and that's what he did. So that kind of communication, the two-way dialogue <coughs> that occurs between governments and, and people will only increase in the future. But just going back to the beginning of what it was that I said, is that we're at this crossroads right now. When you have individuals who are feeling empowered by using tools like uh, Facebook, social technologies like Facebook, governments, when there's kind of profound changes occurring, governments get nervous. And governments look for ways to try to um, control these, these forces. And it's not necessarily only governments that, um, that, uh, you would, that you would think are trying to do this. But it's countries like Brazil who haven't quite figured out their frameworks and their approach yet. Countries like India who have had more of their roots in, uh, in democratic traditions and, um, and, have fa and are a democracy. And so right now, as we sit here in this room, there are, are representatives from every country sitting in Dubai um, at the World Conference of International Telecommunications meeting, a UN-sponsored meeting. And what they are trying to decide is what, whether the internet should be regulated. And so there's a struggle that's going on between governments and people in terms of whether there should be some kind of regulation or control over content and control in the way that people connect and the kinds of things that they're able to share and that kind of free expression. And so what comes out of that, it may be that nothing will come out of these meetings right now. It may be that something, something that seems relatively innocuous but actually gives cover for the future and will affect things in 2020, 2030. But what I, un what I know now is something that Jared said, which is that this is the start of something where representatives from countries around the world are trying to come together to sort out how to do this collectively. And, um, and how we do that will be, um, will be very consequential for how much empowerment the individual has when it comes to 2030. Thank you, Mona. Very interesting question. Thank you, Manning. Please. Good morning, everybody. It's fascinating to be here. I'm really enjoying the um, debates. And I want to extend my thanks to the Atlantic Council as well. Now, I uh, would like to share with you remarks and observations on the internet, basically, and the Arab Spring, my experiences there. In no way am I trying to say anything conclusive, because this is going to take a long time. I, I still don't know why Egyptians rose against Mubarak uh, after 7,000 years, what happened okay, for the masses <laughs> to step out, and it will take years. And this is an issue that certainly will take a long time before you know, uh, there's not enough market research, and it's, the whole thing is quite novel. But here are my uh, observations. Now, before I get into that, for the record, I come from mainstream media. Now, 
uh, new media has changed everything for us. We are linear in our work, and if there is, uh, for example, a political leader assassinated, that will be the first issue in the news bulletin. And then possibly a story about a kitten that got trapped on a tree, and that comes on the back page like as you know, an, a piece of entertainment or a final piece on the news you know, to put a smile on everybody's face. But with social media, we could find on Facebook or on Google Video that that is the most watched video and that the assassination of a political leader comes second or third or fourth. Now, I need to keep my eyes on that so I don't, I'm not forced into early retirement okay, <laughs> or changing jobs. However, if I'm running a paper or a TV station and the first story is about the kitten and the second, everybody on the shift is going to get fired. Okay? And, and I will hope that the board of directors don't fire me. Okay? But the, the, I will have no second thought. Everybody loses his job. Uh, that's <coughs> one. The second remark is, uh, in, in, in one of the WikiLeaks, I'm quoted saying that the Mubarak's opposition from which I came from is almost dead. And the only place where there is opposition for Mubarak is the Facebook, Google, Twitter generation. Okay? That's uh, in, uh, a leak, a State Department cable. Now, um, yeah. Uh, okay, just going back to the. Uh, mm. Now, on 24 January, if you asked me what was going to happen tomorrow, I said, no, I have no idea. And when people um, were annoyed at me, you know, you're supposed to be an analyst, come on, give us an idea, I, I simply answered and said, if you gave 100 <coughs> analysts a fact sheet on Tunisia and told them that tomorrow a street trader is going to go set himself on fire in front of a government building, what chances are there that the Arab Spring, and I, I think it's bigger than the Arab Spring, I think it's going to extend to Iran and, and further, uh, will occur. The 100 will say zero chance, you see. However, on 28 January, after I saw what happened, I joined the demonstrations for the first time, but woke up in the morning and found that Mubarak used the kill switch. He shut off the internet and mobile phone connections. Now, here is one question. Did that make people get together? Had he kept the internet on, would have people sat in the comfort of their homes, you know, tweeting and writing statuses, etc., instead of dis deciding to physically go meet? Unanswered question. I don't think we'll... Uh, oh, it's going to be a long time before we can answer that question. Uh, now, once the internet was returned a week later, it empowered everybody. People felt he was threatened by it and that they got their way and so started using it extensively. And I remember the first status I wrote on Facebook was I never had an idea. I, I never imagined that when I signed up for my Facebook profile, I was signing for the tool that would finish Mubarak. Okay? And that was everything led me to, 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 to believe that. However, that was challenged later on 19 March when we had a referendum on whether the Constitution should be drafted first or elections first. <laughs> now, I was for elections first because I refused that the military select a committee to draft the Constitution. But Facebook and Twitter became really Soviet. It was dangerous to say that you are going to vote yes. And I remember on a status or a tweet saying, you know, guys, I am going to vote yes. However, I'm really concerned that you notify the prosecutor general against me or, you know, somebody presses charges because I'm doing that. And I really began to think there's going to be a landslide vote of no. But it was the opposite direction. And so we started questioning for the first time, did social media trigger off people, as we you know, initially believed? Um, uh, anyway, it's, I'm, I'm just trying to get so much in the, the um, what happened? Oh, what else? 
and hold it in memory. Well, you've raised an interesting question about the relationship between the mainstream media and social media yes, that I yes, think is really yeah. worth exploring. Yes, now, <coughs> again, uh, we have weak media. After 60 years of military rule, our media is extremely weak. The first independent daily in 50 <coughs> years was Al Masri Liom, like uh, Banning said earlier. And um, <coughs> social media began to set the agenda for mainstream me media. Okay? And that was extremely dangerous. And part of this information meltdown that is happening now in the Arab region or wherever there's been a, an uprising. And um, uh, you know, right now, Egypt is boiling again. And I get up in the morning, and I want to check and find out what's happening. And I do resort to about 60% of my information will come from social media. Okay, Facebook statuses, uh, YouTube videos, etc. But it's because of my ability to verify. But for regular folk who are not, you know, uh, professionally employed in the media, uh, it, it it can have the counter uh, effect. You see. Uh, anyway, to conclude, do I think that? eventually the individual will prevail. I have enough evidence in front of me to say that that would be very dangerous and that the establishment has to prevail and uh, social media would contribute and be a major source of information. I'll leave it at that. It's a very, you know, one of the things that <coughs> you implied and, and Marnie is this question of trust. You know, it can kind of work many different ways. I mean, one is my, my friends say that this is a, a good movie, this is a good company to deal with, this is a, a cause I should donate to, I should go out and conserve energy. And because my friends said it, I'm much more likely to do it and entrust that, well, their judgment's good. And therefore, I think it has a very positive impact on, on governance and involvement of people and getting people to do things they don't really trust. I mean, the power company sends you something and says, pay another X number of dollars per month and we'll get green energy that you're actually paying for rather than fossil fuels. And you kind of ignore it. But if your friend said that they're doing it, then maybe you'd start to sign up. So you could spread some things very positively. But the other part of the trust is you could start trusting conspiracy theories. You could start trusting uh, completely untrue things that are spread by your friends or the media that you, tr you deal with all the time. And so this can be very viral. I mean, I think we've seen that in this country on a number of, from birther movements and all the other, uh, many other things that have gone on here where the, a group of people, which expands very rapidly to a large group, start spreading things because my friend said it, uh, then I, I start to believe it. Or I think Facebook is now the largest, biggest source of news for people in the United States, I believe. And their friends post to Facebook, they see what they post. So we know this whole niche thing. So this is, a, I think, a, a phenomenon that I don't know how it's going to play out. But it has a, it's very, very two-sided. And, and I don't know, you know if any of you want to comment on that, but I think it's, a, it, it's an interesting problem going forward. Go ahead, Marnie. Well, um, I think that, um, I mean, what you say is, is true, that there's so much information. I mean, if you just sort of look at the evolution of the internet, when you had, you had so much information and then Google came along and provided a search engine to help you be able to find the kind of information that you needed. And, um, but that information was sort of the wisdom of crowds. Um, it was, you know, how many people linked to something. And that is useful for what you want to, that can be useful. Um, it can be very useful. But in a world <coughs> where you have a lot of information and you're trying to sort through things, um, it's also useful to be able to have your friends help um, sort out what information might be helpful or might be interesting, uh, interesting to you. So that's where, the, that's where the trust part comes out. I think that on um, a service like Facebook, you have a combination of different kinds of friends. So you have your very good friends, but you, and, and those are called sort of strong ties. But you also have some weaker ties um, uh, on Facebook. Um, who are not necessarily, you know, your five or your ten closest friends, and they often serve as a source of information for you. Um, so it doesn't necessarily sort of implicit in your question is whether um, is whether there's a kind of echo chamber that forms of your own views, 
or whether they whether you're sort of biased towards only kinds of you know information that your friends are giving you but you really can be exposed to a wider array of information and um, and be able to sort through that and in some sense and I think there was a study I think it was in uh, well, I can come back on this if anybody's actually interested in it, that your weaker ties actually help influence much of what it is that you're um, interested in rather than just the stronger ties. So I think that um, by having an array of information, you're able to sort through some of this stuff and pick out what is of interest and um, of importance to you. You want to comment on that? Or? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it, what, what's interesting is the increased visibility that, that, that we have, and this pertains to revolutions, to conflict, to just getting news. I mean, it, it's people often say, wow, the world is really violent today. Well, actually, it's, it's less violent than it's ever been. We just see every little bad thing that happens in any corner of the globe. And by the way, I would argue that that visibility is a good thing because it heightens awareness. It therefore heightens accountability. Uh, it doesn't mean, you know, bad deeds uh, will always be punished, but it does mean that you know, if uh, individuals are engaged in hostile activity, it is harder to get away with it. It is harder to do it um, in, in a complete blackout. Um, I think that the real question in the future is going to be who verifies all of this, right? It, it's, if we go back to the next five billion uh, uh, trend, that's five billion new people generating enormous amounts of content. And believe me, they'll be really excited about having devices to generate lots of content. It's the amount of information that will be out there will be so overwhelming that at a certain point, somebody's going to have to, to verify it. I think this is going to be a very important role that uh, the mainstream media plays, but I also think that there's going to be an important role um, that, that, that non-media stakeholders play. So you can imagine in a situation where there's a conflict, you, have, you don't just send in uh, human rights monitors and you don't just send in the Red Cross, you send in uh, international verification monitors who actually go on the ground and make sure that the, you know, sort of you know, help determine you know, which individuals on the ground are actually generating you know, credible video, verified video, verified content. He said, well, looking at Egypt, how, how does that play out there? Who verifies the information that spreads so rapidly now through, uh, th through um, the social media? Unfortunately, you know, that, uh, no good job is being done of that. Okay, <coughs> but the amount again of information that is coming through for people who can personally verify mm -hmm. is amazing. And I just watched this gruesome video of uh, an act. I don't want to get into it by the President Morsi's supporters this morning, and. Without social media, it would have not been there because somebody basically using a phone filmed it and put it uh, on. Or the fact that the attacks on uh, the demonstrators who were uh, protesting outside his office, that was again social media and, and it went on uh, mainstream media from there. And a lot of what is happening, Syria for example, a lot of it is really coming through the citizen journalist who resorts to social media to post his uh, whatever information and then we take it from there. So the amount of bad quality footage that we're seeing now on TV, but it's the only footage available. So the, social, the, the regular media is responding to the social media and, and it's setting the agenda. And this is, uh, you know, how does government start to, to play in and build trust in dealing with people on information? In other words, one of the interesting things about this whole process is, is transparency. I mean, as an individual, you'll have digital exhaust the rest of your life. So everything you've ever done is going to be out there and available for people. This has, uh, <coughs> means two things to me. One is we're all going to live in glass houses because everybody's going to have something embarrassing that's online somewhere. So we have to be a little more tolerant. And secondly, it would seem to generate good behavior. I mean, you have an incentive not to do bad things that are going to follow you the rest of your life and people won't want to work with you or hire you or deal with you. Uh, this would seem to have an impact on corporations and governments and NGOs that they have to be careful because they're living more and more in a glass house. Uh, how do you think this is going to play out for governments? Well, I actually think that this is an interesting dictator's dilemma of, of the future, right? Which is you're going to, in the future, you're going to have a lot more noise. Uh, you're going to have a lot uh, of manifestations of, of, of digital activity that look like maybe they could be the next revolution, the next major protest. And, you know, the challenge for, you know, any regime in the future is they're going to have to distinguish between what's noise uh, and what's real and make sure that they don't overreact to something that's just noise and don't underreact to something that's in fact real. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, where we're going to see the most change is where they get it wrong. Uh, you know, an overreaction, as, as uh, Hisham mentioned, uh, in, in the case of, of uh, uh, you know, many of these places in, in, in uh, the Middle East and North Africa had a, had a huge impact. I actually do believe that had Mubarak not shut down 
the networks, he, he might still be in power. I was in Tahrir Square during the revolution. I asked a, a, a number of people on the streets why they went there. And a number of them said, you know, this wasn't my fight. And then Mubarak took away the internet and, and my mobile device, and he really pissed me off. <laughs> uh, or you know, I talked to I talked to another young kid who said, "What was I going to do? Sit at home in my you know house where I share a room with a couple of siblings, with a computer that wasn't working and a phone that wasn't working." And I wanted to actually see what was happening. And so, uh, so I think this question of noise is going to be very very interesting, and in how uh, leaders and governments deal with that noise and um, figure out what to actually react to is interesting. I'll tell you a very uh, a very good story. Uh, that was shared to me by the, the Prime Minister of Singapore about curry. Um, there was a conflict uh, between a Singaporean of Indian descent and a Singaporean of Chinese descent over cooking curry in a hallway that they, they shared. And, and um, they got this big disagreement in typical Singaporean fashion. They hired a mediator. Um, and the mediator worked it out, and it was all fine. Anyway, two years later, the mediator went public with her story. And it played into certain uh, members of, of, of the opposition's concerns about foreigners coming in and taking jobs in Singapore. Anyway, they declared, you know, online they declared this national day of cooking curry, and the prime minister said that they hadn't actually, you know, they, they didn't sort of think much of it because what could possibly happen with people being upset about curry? Anyway, long story short, it ended up with all of these people in the streets, one of the sort of largest modern day uh, demonstrations in Singapore, all because of something that started with cooking curry. And what you learn from that is in the future, revolutionary triggers are going to be much easier to find. Um, and uh, you know, it's always going to be these sort of unpredict, uh, you know, unpredictable catalytic uh, events or incidents that you know, end up surprising everybody, including governments. And maybe it will be curry. Maybe it will be something more substantive, although I do like curry. <laughs> But it's the uh, butterflies, uh, the Lorenz's butterfly that flaps its wings in the Amazon and sets off a tornado in uh, Texas. But this is Muhammad Bouazizi on December 17th, what, two years ago, uh, immolating himself in Tunisia and the, and the hurricane still blowing through the Middle East. So I think you're right. That's uh, th This is a, a complexity problem for all of us. Did, did you want to yeah, comment? No, I, I, I think it's really interesting to see, though, how governments are using tools like this to try to get a pulse. And there are all these new examples of, of, of different kinds of models that are emerging. And that's why it's not necessarily about the individual versus the state or the state versus the individual and how these collaborations can work. So let me just give you a couple examples. One example that I think is really interesting, and uh, just to show you even coming out of the Obama administration that I am a bar bipartisan now, um, is that uh, <laughs> Majority Leader Eric Cantor um, came up with a thing called the Citizen Co-Sponsor app. And what this is is that it allows you to download this app. They list all the legislation that is coming up. And then you, as a citizen, can co-sponsor or like that uh, piece of legislation. And so let's say it was the Clean Water Act. You would then um, you know, appear as a co-sponsor of this, of this Clean Water Act uh, legislation. And you would um, get regular updates about it. And then uh, the Majority Leader's Office can sort of see, can kind of take a pulse on what's happening, where the interest lies, and how, and how it's going. So there are applications <coughs> like that that are forming that will evolve over time, and policymakers can get more information and develop a better pulse on what's happening. There are other things like amber alerts. You know, it used to be that you would put, if there was a missing child, that it was on the back of a, um, of a milk carton, and then you got a flyer in the mail that showed you a photograph of somebody. But now what we do, what, now what we have is in connection with law enforcement and uh, the Department of Justice, we've created a partnership uh, where we've created a page for each state and an amber alert on Facebook and you see the pictures and so it can be law enforcement things, it's the difference, it shrinks the distance and the time between finding out about a missing or exploited child and being able to engage citizens to actually help law, law enforcement find a missing child. So it's that kind of collaboration. I've given you two kinds of US examples, but there are examples around the world of how this is, about how this is happening. And where the, th where the threat comes, where the tension comes, is when you deny, when countries sort of say, we're gonna cut off access or we're going to, um, or we're gonna put parameters around what kind of engagement we're gonna have. In general, whether there's noise or not, the noise is much better than cutting off uh, the discussion or, or, or cutting off the, the two-way kind of dialogue that can occur between um, governments and citizens. And I think that you know, Egypt is the perfect example of that. It was the will of people 
who, um, of courageous people going out into the streets. But it was also, technology was a part of it, but it was very much about people and how technology was amplifying the voices of, of the people that were there at, because they didn't have the ability to communicate with the government in other ways. They had to either march with their feet or, or use uh, uh, services like Facebook or Twitter to be able to communicate. You want to comment? Sure. I think verification will remain with mainstream media, okay? Mm -hmm. Because we, uh, in, in mainstream media, there is always a desk uh, the news gatherers who are monitoring all the social media <coughs> as a source, but we always need to verify it. You know, media can create wars, recessions, and people in the end will always go to a publication or a uh, uh, channel that can be sued for information. But when information comes from, say, Blue Monkey, you know, he's tweeted something or put something on a. Uh, uh, how, how much can you rely on that? You know, I, I, I worked uh, within the Bahraini Independent Commission of Inquiry, and I was assigned to look into incitement in media, whether you know, incitement is a, um, a felony. It has very clear standards. You need to differentiate between it and derogatory language. Otherwise, you bring down the ceiling of free ex expression. And when I started working, nothing in mainstream media was incitement. And uh, incitement as in the case of Rwanda or Kosovo or uh, Sri Lanka. But when I went to uh, social media, I was horrified. And Bahrain is a tender, tender box. And if a regional war breaks out, you, you think it's going, uh, um, it, it will break out from Bahrain. And the recommendation I made to them was allow the opposition, because it was really lopsided, six papers owned by the regime and one paper by the um, uh, opposition, and broadcast strictly in the hands of uh, the regime. Okay? And my recommendation was, careful, this is where it could uh, start a war, uh, uh, social media. So allow more space for uh, main, uh, mainstream media, uh, and basically give them a voice. That's very interesting as you have more and more uh, people online expressing their voices in places like China, and they can't stop that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if you think you're controlling information, you're really not. It's spreading anyway. Huh? Very different. And I think we need to go some, Chris Nelson had a question back there, and uh, then we've got some various questions. I'm sorry we've uh, waited so long. Yeah, to identify yourself yeah, first. Uh, Chris Nelson, also report, and uh, something of a practitioner. Um, what you're really talking about is who's going to mediate. It isn't just verifying whether it's a conspiracy theory or did the guy from Mars really arrive. You're, you're talking about how, how do institutions, how do modern media, including Facebook, do you mediate so it isn't taken over by the crazies and the birthers and, and all that? And I'm interested to know if you guys are addressing it in that way. Uh, uh, is, there, is there a way that Facebook or, or Google or anybody else says, no, wait a minute, the, you know, th this, this isn't right. You know, we all know how we used to do it. You know, we'd read Dave Ignatius, or we'd, we'd grab a paper that Banning Garrett wrote, right? Well, it, in the future, how is that going to work? Is it going to work the same way? Uh, and I think the implications for governance are pretty clear. In some ways, the world you're describing is a world of direct participatory democracy. Well, you know, we don't have that in this country. It wasn't set up that way. It's a representative democracy. You're supposed to trust the mediators to figure out what the best thing to do. You know, uh, the founders would listen to this conversation and have a heart attack. Now, we may be right and they may have been wrong, but by God, it's changing. So uh, what does it mean if, in fact, representative democracy no longer works that way? Or is that the mediator? Thank you. That's a very good question. Who would like to comment on that? I mean, I'll, I'll make a, a, a technology observation, which is part of the reason why you're even asking this question is because today's technologies are the first technologies that allow any individual to own, develop, and disseminate their own content without having to rely on an intermediary. Um, so, so I think we're, we're in this stage right now where it looks like, you know, gone are the days where there's intermediaries, but I actually think that you know, the amount of content, again, is going to be so significant that we're going to see um, a resurfacing of intermediaries around curation, around verification, um, ar around a lot, a lot of these things. And my, my, my view is where there's a problem, there's a company that's going to fill that gap. Uh, there's a startup that's going to fill that gap. Part of the reason I'm not actually that worried is, is, is twofold. Um, 
One, um, you know, there's a lot of young people looking to build startups to address exactly what you're talking about, and I have a lot of confidence that um, people will, will figure it out, um, and they'll make a lot of money in the, in the process. Um, the, the second observation is um, I'm still not convinced that, um, you know, social media is what we should be blaming here. I'm, you know, convinced that we maybe are getting more visibility into the popular sentiments of larger numbers of people, and maybe we just don't like what we see. Um, you know, there's, there's a, an argument out there that people like to make that, you know, technology just reinforces views. No, I actually think a back alley mosque in a slum of Riyadh is a way to actually reinforce views because there's no challenging of opinions, there's no, uh, uh, you know, sort of, there's no semblance of critical thinking. All the schools are rote memorization. You, know, you may not like what you hear online, but the reality is you can challenge it. Other people can challenge it. And by the way, even if you're the most closed-minded, judgmental person on earth, you cannot avoid, you know, finding something in your newsfeed or um, in your RSS feed that uh, is essentially something you, you disagree with. So it's really difficult to be closed-minded in isolation now. We just may not like you know, sort of a lot of the popular sentiments that we're seeing. Anybody in the real, I know the back has can trouble I, getting, uh, oh, oh I, you, I'm sorry, yeah. please go ahead and come. See, from my experience and what I saw, I think it will improve representative democracy, but democracy can only be representative because what happened, in my case, I, I left Tahrir one day after Mubarak was out and said, it's time to build this country. Khalas, we got rid of Mubarak. But social media allowed for something called a permanent revolution. And you had kids who were sitting there on Twitter and Facebook and uh, trying to form a cabinet, okay, and nominating people. And I was saying, uh, I made myself very unpopular with these young revolutionaries who originally saw me as one of the, you know, the hardcore Mubarak opposition, but they were horrified in me because I was saying, it's time to build the country. You can't go on, you know, uh, in this permanent revolution where you think you can make policy on social media. But they were there nominating ministers, etc. So it can be a hint to the, the policy maker but it can't be the way to form a cabinet. Yani I remember telling them, you know, boys, <laughs> if you're looking for a minister of interior, uh, chief of the police, I'm very happy to take the job, and I promise you I will send you every fire engine in town twice a day to unload its tank on you in Tahrir so that you, you know, cool <laughs> off and sober up a little. <laughs> <laughs> Is anybody in the, in the back that has, can, way back there, yeah, I think we've got to have some representative of the, back end of this. Uh, Hi, I'm Jeff Leifel with the Atlantic Council, and I actually wanted to get um, Hisham right back to that question, because is it not true, I'm a little bit of a skeptic here, is it not true that while these young people were tweeting, the Muslim Brotherhood, Brotherhood was out canvassing, and this is an 80-year-old institution that has existed in Egypt far before Facebook or Google, and that's who's controlling Egypt today, not the Facebook crowd, isn't that Correct. Well, yes, certainly. You know, that's what I, I was telling them recently. Like, you know, well done, 007. You know, look what, what happened. You know, we ended up because I was telling them it's time to get into politics. Go join parties instead of sitting there and on social media becoming your only occupation and uh, voicing your opinions. No, you need to parallel that with some uh, organizational, uh, you know, entities. Uh, and uh, now there is that awareness that uh, more of them are enrolling into parties and becoming disciplined and realizing, you know, okay, it's very nice to sit there and say, unacceptable, uh, never uh, again, but it, it needs to be translated into something practical. But that, I mean, it was never, it was never meant to be that the Facebook crowd was going to sort of come into power and govern. I mean, you technology it can be an aid, can enhance, can can help to influence, but you still, and citizens aren't necessarily stepping into different roles. You need, it can only happen with institutional reform, with an empowered civil society, and with leadership. And without those things, then, um, then you're not gonna have a working, functioning kind of government and society. So I, it was never meant to be a, a, a complete, you know, that Facebook was going to sun, somehow become the government. And if I could, if I could just build on, on what Marty said, which I, I completely agree with, um, I think part of the challenge you have uh, with these, uh, the advent of these tools and, and their incorporation into 
revolutions is the barriers of entry have been lowered. So somebody can be a full-time activist, a part-time activist, an anonymous activist, an, or an activist using their real name. And what's happening is the, uh, the, the new sort of modern way of doing revolution is producing a lot of celebrities, but not really very many new leaders who have different last names um, and can run for president and actually win. Um, and a lot of these societies where um, these revolutions are taking place don't really have much of a history of institutions besides the religious institutions. Um, I think part of the other challenge you have, bu building on this point of leadership, because I think this is uh, probably the, the, the biggest challenge we're going to face with this accelerated pace uh, of, of revolutions, is it used to be that you were uh, a leader first and then you became a public figure. Now we've reversed it and you become a public figure and then maybe you become a leader down the line. My concern is that the accelerated pace of movement making is actually going to retard leadership development. Um, you know, if you think about Mandela, Lech Walesa, you know, it took decades and decades of these, uh, uh, decades and decades for these men to actually develop the credentials and the credibility and the experience such that when they actually emerged and became known, they were ready to take, uh, they were ready to take the country forward. So the question is, you know, we're still going to have technology kind of creating space for all these unlikely leaders. What are we actually going to do to backfill them with the leadership skills that they actually need to be the next generation of leaders. And maybe in 10 years, we'll go back through you know, YouTube or go back through the tapes and we'll look at sort of who did what during the Arab Spring. It'll be interesting to look at who's actually developed leadership skills versus who has sort of um, you know, kind of disappeared off the, the, the face of the earth. And so I think we have to get at this question of, of leadership. But at the end of the day, you know, technology can't you know, sort of replace the need for credible new leaders and functioning institutions. Uh, John Stewart on The Daily Show last week said, I want to introduce my next, next uh, guest. He's the boss from New Jersey. And the joke, of course, was it, it wasn't really Bruce Springsteen. It was uh, Chris Christie. Uh, <laughs> and uh, that, that's uh, the issue you're raising is, is the boss, Springsteen, far more famous than Chris Christie and have a bigger Twitter follower and become a, a national leader and then be expected to be a political leader. Or is it going to be somebody who's really been out in the trenches running a government and, and uh, then emerges on the national scene as a political leader? Very interesting uh, question forward. Uh, Arlen, I know you've been, you've been patient here. I think you could do news for cows if you remember Garrett Morris. Uh, I'm Harlan Ullman. An observation, then a question. Um, in 1902 and 1903, the Royal United Services Institute held a really fascinating conference called 1920. And if you read, read the reports from that particular conference, they were looking at these technological miracles, such as radio, nuclear power, Einstein, the airplane. You could actually send a message around the world through the underground cable that took 10 minutes. And the conclusions were that uh, interdependence was going to make war impossible because of economic linkages. And the number one danger at that stage was terrorists because all heads of state, kings, queens, and so forth were getting knocked off. And it's very interesting to think about over 100 years ago and wonder how much has really changed except in the speed of things. <coughs> My question is this, however. If you look at the 20th century, in many ways, that was a century of personality. <coughs> On the positive side of the ledger, you had Teddy Roosevelt, you had Franklin Roosevelt, you had Churchill, you had Eisenhower, you had people like that. On the negative side, you have Hitler, you have Lenin, you have Stalin, and on the ambivalent side, you have Mao, Deng, and uh, Joe. My question is, as you look forward in this debate between the individual and the state, we see in the 21st century so far basically personalities of celebrities with the exception of Osama bin Laden, who has probably had the most impact of any individual. When you think about the future, tell me how you come out with the role of individuals. Are we going to see great leaders as we saw in the 20th century, or are we going to be stuck with celebrities and people like bin Laden who are going to be dominating the politics? Wow. You want to start? No. <laughs> uh, why don't you talk about the individual, and I'll talk about terrorism. Um, Hmm, it's a great question. Um, you know, I am, I think that uh, I'm optimistic that you will see, um, that you will see great leaders. Um, I think the origins of the leadership may be different than where they came from before. So, um, so you might see, I mean, in a country even like the United States, you might see people starting um, in Silicon Valley or something, 
um, somebody who is part of creating something uh, big and um, and then moving and and uh, creating a following and uh, uh, empowering individuals in that way. I mean, if you think about it, what is leadership about? Leadership is about become being part of something that's bigger than yourself, having some kind of following, and being able to influence them to do hopefully good things. Um, that's the positive form of leadership. You also highlighted some other kinds of negative uh, uh, people who've had impact in leadership positions, but, um, it's, but it hasn't necessarily been positive. So you might see people coming from different backgrounds than you've traditionally seen. Um, it may not be um, that people go straight into government um, or, um, or you know, come out of academic institutions. It might be that you com they come from more non-traditional um, areas. But I'm, but I'm optimistic about that, and I think that some of the tools that have emerged um, through technology uh, allow people to understand what people want, need, and to be able to collaborate in ways that they haven't been able to before to come up with solutions to, uh, to big problems. And um, I was saying earlier when we were back and before we came out here, I mean, one of the reasons that I went into government um, uh, when I did was, from an early age, was that I was interested in finding um, uh, broad scale policy solutions to help people, like really to help people. Um, right now, what you see is that it's really difficult to get things done in government. Um, different parties are, you know, sparring with each other. People have different, um, aren't necessarily motivated by, uh, they're motivated by politics and not necessarily by um, policy and finding exactly what the right solution is for, for people. I think you can use thing. I think you can use certain kinds of platforms and technologies to address some of these broad scale um, societal issues um, around health, around education, around energy and the environment um, that you haven't been able to do before. And the example that I used back there, and then I'll stop, is that um, you know take organ donation. Um, organ, you know, in the United States, you have roughly. Uh, 115,000 or 113,000 people a day who are waiting for an organ, and it's the difference between life and death for them. Of those, 18 die a day. This is a solvable problem. We just need to generate more organs, so you have to have more organ donors. And the way that you can influence that is by having people influence other people. And so one thing that we did with Facebook is we allowed people to say when they've become an organ donor, and then others um, see that, and then they become they post that they've become an organ donor, and it makes it um, faster and easier for people to sign up. And so this is a kind of problem that can be solved. So will there be great leaders? <coughs> I think so, yes. And, um, and will they come from the traditional places that you've seen before? Maybe they'll come from other places. I think you heard it first here, Mark Zuckerberg for president. I think that's what we're <laughs> going to see. Uh, no, I think we're, we're nearing the end here, so I think I need to have a final comments from, uh, you know, Jared and. and so you're not going to get the terrorism. That's. Well, you can make your final comment about terrorism. We're, we're way over I'll time. Be, I'll just so be I'll very, I'm very trying to be good here. <laughs> I'll be very quick, and then I'll, I'll give it. I'll shorten my final my final comment. Um, you know, I think that the profile of, of, of who's a terrorist is going to change in the future, and I think Nigeria offers a very interesting case study for this. So you have in the north, you have Boko Haram, which is a horrific traditional terrorist organization with almost in a part of the country where there's almost no connectivity to the internet. Uh, in the southern part of the country, in Lagos, you have some of the best 419 criminal scammers in the entire world who do have plenty of access to, to, to the internet. Eventually, Nigeria is going to be completely connected. And what you then have is two anti-establishment communities uh, joining up. And you have a scary situa situation where we're not talking about uh, coordinated, just coordinated physical attacks or just coordinated cyber attacks, but actually you know, coordinated attacks across two different dimensions. I, I, th I think the future uh, uh, terrorist organization, you know, it's not going to be so much who's their leader, but who's their chief technology officer. Um, I also think an interesting question to ask is, you know, when you know FATA is completely connected, and we learn about a, uh, a, a ring of, of, of cyber terrorists operating in South Waziristan, and we get intelligence on a particular plan that they're uh, looking to undertake, will we see the first drone strike 
against cyber terrorists. I, I, I don't know. Um, but in terms of, of com concluding remarks, there's a, uh, an obscure American inventor who's so obscure that um, his name escapes me now, who had a very <laughs> wise quote where he said, we should all be concerned about the future because we're going to have to spend our time there. Um, and I think that quote holds very much true. My last comment is we often sort of speculate about will the future be multipolar, nonpolar, unipolar, whatever other sort of polar, uh, you know, sort of, uh, you know, pronoun you could, you, uh, 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 you know, you can add to it. Uh, but my view is that the way that we have to think about the future is we're entering into a multidimensional moment where the world is as much uh, virtual as it is physical. Understanding a state's power uh, will uh, uh, be determined by what they do in cyberspace and what they do in the physical world. Understanding the power of an individual will uh, uh, be determined by their ability to manage uh, what seems to be a virtual entourage of identities and content about them. Um, so the way that we have to think about power and influence in the future um, has to take into account um, factors across both the physical and virtual dimensions. Do you want to make a final yeah, comment? Um, thank you again for uh, convening this forum and um, allowing us to talk about this. I've really enjoyed it. I, and I would just go back to something that I said at the beginning, which is, um, which is this. We kind of take for granted in some ways what a free and open internet means and what having access to these kinds of tools mean. But you, you, know, you, heard, to, you heard today that um, when a country uses a kill switch and turns that off, what that means for the individual and what that means for the state. And it doesn't mean goodness on either side. And so that thing that we talk about, which we've sort of come to take for granted, the open and free internet, the free association, the ability to connect, the ability to share, being connected to knowledge and information cannot be taken for granted. And if I leave you with one message today, it would be don't take it for granted. And so when you see, as we try to sort of figure out what goes on in the, what's going to happen in the future, we need to look now at the countries that are struggling to figure out um, how they're going to try to control and manage this to get, uh, to get control over people, to get in c control over ideas that they don't necessarily, that feel threatening to them. Because what those countries do, what those countries in the middle do, um, will, will really influence and impact um, people's access to these tools that can be used for really great, um, really great and powerful things. Change. Well, okay. I'm a very conservative person in the way I conduct my work. And, you know, if a reporter tells me that he has a hunch, I, I would be very annoyed, <coughs> you know. I, I'd say you need more than a hunch <laughs> to follow that story, okay? I joined Facebook and uh, in 2007, one of my nieces or nephews sent me an invitation. And I didn't know what Facebook was about. And I just thought, well, you know, I don't, I don't want to embarrass her. Sure, here's a profile. And then eventually, the more I you know, followed, it's, I started seeing this nightmare okay, of social media on the whole, and it was very irritating for me. <laughs> and uh, in lots of cases, you read something and you say, oh, you know, sh you know, shut up, disappear, go away, uh, et cetera. And it, but then I began to ask the question to myself, why did Facebook and uh, Twitter and all uh, forms of citizen uh, uh, journalism and uh, self-expression appear? And it was because I realized there was a need for it. People needed a venue to be able to express themselves directly. They did not necessarily think that reading an article I wrote that vents their anger is the way for self-expression. And so it, it really began to change things for me, and I started committing myself f you know, to, 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 to merge, work together, and allow for a greater voice for uh, the public. I think we're, what we've seen today in this discussion is that it's a very volatile, volatile uh, world forward, very uncertain. There'll be a lot of experiments on this relationship between social media and governance, individual and state. Uh, Mao had a, a, a poem that he'd like to quote uh, it was about the Cultural Revolution, <coughs> but the line I like is that the, uh, the tree prefers calm, but the wind will not subside. And if anything uh, characterizes what we seem to be looking forward uh, in the next 20 years, is it's going to be a very uncertain, the wind's going to keep blowing, and how these will work out, these, in, these relationships we talked about, probably different in very, every country is going to be a little different, there'll be a lot of ex social experimentation, a lot of desire for the wind to subside and have stability, we're probably not going to get that. Uh, Jared, Marnie. Tishan, thank you very, very much for, I think, a stimulating panel. And <laughs>